May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We seem to live in a world that gives attention to the external things of life. What kind of house do you live in? What kind of car do you drive? How much money do you make? What is your net worth? Jesus would hear this and just shake his head in disappointment. Why? Because Jesus knows what really matters is not the external, but the internal. He knows that the real you is who you are inside. All of our exits must be entrances. There's a great human capacity to take whatever life dishes out and to come back, which should never be underestimated. How amazing it is, knowing we are all going to die anyhow, that we are so determined to live as well as we can, no matter what. For all of our little deaths, we defy our fate and come to life again and again. It seems like we are constantly trying to redeem ourselves in the unspoken rituals of life and renewal. We get up, we go to work, like we are in the construction business of building and repairing our lives. Some call it healing, rebirth, born again, or my all-time personal favorite, simply getting my act together. Whenever you want to, whatever you want to call it, however large or how small an act, the urge is always to reassemble the fragments of our lives into a whole. The urge is always the same. Yet there are those who get tired of trying, who don't care, and who's, who choose to live externally. That's what Jesus wanted to relate to his hearers on the day he and his disciples went to Gennesaret. We find Jesus engaged in a sharp and heated conversation with the scribes and the Pharisees. The point of contention was the ceremonial washing of hands before you eat. They were convinced that the truly spiritual folks would go through the rituals. And so Jesus used this as an occasion to rebuke them in very strong terms of placing tradition above the clear commandments of God. In fact, he calls them hypocrites and, saying, and says that their hypocrisy was prophesied by Isaiah. The Lord said, because these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is human commandment learned in rout. So I will again do amazing things with these people. The wisdom of their wives shall perish and the discernment of the discerning shall be hidden. Really, how often is it that people honor God with their lips and not their hearts and not their minds? Isaiah declares they are drugged by their own sin. Because it is God they have insulted and his law that they have flouted, Isaiah can say with certainty that the Lord has blinded them. The spiritual insensibility is the result of sheer hypocrisy and their, the hypocrisy of their hearts as well. To these people, God's words are inintelligible. The book is closed for these people, and they are spiritually illiterate. Isaiah points out the world is immense in material concerns and inevitably, inevitably grows less and less sensitive to the presence of God in, in our lives and until it becomes blind to all the warning and appeals. However, Jesus decides to press the issue because of its importance in defining what true spiritual, spirituality is. He calls for the crowds to make clear who the real you really are. He's emphatic that we understand that real faith and de devotion of God is not a matter of religious form. 
It's a matter of the heart. The real you is who you are on the inside. Jesus calls the crowds to him to listen in on this debate. What is the essence of true spirituality and godliness? This is the conversation everybody needs to hear. He ushers forth a twofold commandment, hear and understand. He says it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth. Defilement or spiritual or moral pollution is not a matter of washing your hands. Now what matters is what is in your heart because what is in your heart will eventually come out of the mouth. What is on the inside will eventually come out for all to see. Now 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this. The Lord says to Samuel as he begins his inspection of Jesse's sons, do not look on his appearance or at his physical stature. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When Howard, when Howard Cardell, Car, bleh, when Howard Carter <laughs> and his associates found King Tuck's tomb, they opened his casket and they found another one on the inside. They opened the second one which was covered with gold leaf and found a third. Inside the casket, the casket of the fourth one, was made of pure gold. The Pharaoh's body was in the fourth one, wrapped in gold with a gold face mask. But when the body was unwrapped, it was all leathery and shriveled. So whether we're trying to clothe a dead spiritual life or something else in the caskets of gold to impress others, the beauty of the exterior does not change the absence of what's, what's interior. What does your interior look like anyway? Is it shallow and weak or is it strong and vibrant? When I think of the beautiful interior I think of my dad's 58 Chevrolet Impala. That thing had more chrome on the inside than on the outside. How was I to take my driving lesson in that? Because I had to sit on about three pillows, I think, and then I couldn't reach the foot pillow. Well, in the forest, you find lots of trees, don't you? The ones that tower above all the others and appear to be a picture of strength and maturity. But loggers will sometimes not even bother to cut them down. You have to wonder why they would leave them. After all, it would seem a tree that big would contain three times the amount of lumber or as a smaller tree. The reason's simple. Huge trees are often rotten on the inside. They are the hollow trees that children's picture books show a raccoon living in. They are the trees on the outside but rotten on the inside. Yet another analogy of Jesus' explanation of the condition of the heart. <clears throat> in verse 12 through 13 of Matthew, we see that the disciples evidently were taken aback by what Jesus had to say. The Pharisees certainly were, and the text says they were off, they were offended. And in the Greek, that means scandalized by what he said. Did they hear him right? What did he say? Jesus quickly assures them that they had heard it correctly and provides an analogy to drive home the point. Those who major on the externals and ignore matters of the heart prove that God is not their heavenly spiritual father. They've got heart disease. Full of life, threatening impurities. They will be uprooted and destroyed in the judgment. John 8, 42 to 47, Jesus, in that book, Jesus reminds us that we are either children of God or children of the devil. 
It is Christ who cleanses our spiritual hearts and repairs the defects. There's no third choice. Now to challenge the subject, did you know there is more to Holy Communion than you think? There's been new research at Cornell, Cornell University that has identified a chemical in the grape that the Journal of Applied Cardiology says reduces the risk of heart disease. Hmm, who knew? I should have mentioned it last week at, or a couple of weeks ago at our communion. But Jesus goes on to use a second image because they pride themselves as guided by the blind. He said, leave them alone. They're blind. A term he uses four times in, verse, in chapter 14, and they will lead others with them into a pit of destruction. They're blind. They're willfully blind. On November 8th, 1991, 34-year-old Lolita Arleano willingly beheaded her three children and offered their heads to pacify Mount Pinatubo, the volcano. The Filipino volcano began to erupt the following summer and many tremors that followed. Spiritual blindness and superstitious fears of many people caused countless tragedies even in our age. In our story, next along comes Peter, asking as a, acting as the spokesperson to ask Jesus to explain the parable he had just taught. Well, it seems Jesus expresses shock, amazement, or even grief at the question, and says, do you still not understand? Do you still not get it? Are you still so dull in the head? I like that one. I'm paraphrasing, of course. You have to wonder if there were no times when Jesus felt like a, to like a total failure. Still, he pressed on and he tried to give them some insight into what genuine spirituality is. We're to pay attention to the things that matter Steeped in religious legalism, formalism, ritualism, as taught by the religious leaders of their day, the disciples as well as the common people struggled to hear, to see, to understand what real godliness and spirituality is. Jesus realizes this, and so he expands his explanation even further. Food goes into the mouth, into the stomach, is digested, and eliminate it. In contrast, some things do come up from within and out of the mild mouth that defiles you, the pollution of your life, its source, the heart, the real you on the inside. Ceremonies, rituals, and other external practices, baptism giving, Baptism, giving, and church attendance are not the things that prove you belong to God. Some people do all these things and are still lost. It may be hard to understand given our tendency to measure spirituality by the things we do, but the bottom line is this. What is the condition of your heart? From your heart will eventually come out What's in it? Generally, following the latter portion of the Ten Commandments, Jesus notes seven examples, and not exhaustive, that an evil heart will produce. Evil thinking, murder, adultery, thefts, false witness, and slander. Now there's a grocery list for you. Now a brand new lawyer in his brand new office on his first day in the practice, sees a prospective client walk in the door. He decides he should look busy, and so he picks up the phone and he starts talking. Look, Harry, about the amalgamation deal. I think better we should better run down to the factory and handle it personally. 
Yes, no, I don't think. I don't think three million will do it. We'd better have Roger from Seattle meet us here. Okay, call you back later. Well, the prospective client says, you can't help me at all. I'm just here to hook up your phone. You see, however much we guard ourselves against it, we tend to shape ourselves in the image that others might have us in. It's not so much the example of theirs we imagine that we imagine others have of us. It's not so much the example of theirs that we imitate as the reflection of ourselves in their eyes. Paul Eldridge said, we mold our faces to fit our mask. Jesus' point is simple, guard your heart for what a person truly is will be seen by what he or she does. And if your heart is a toxic waste dump, rest assured it's gonna leak out. It is corrosive and it will seep through the walls of your heart and out in the open for all to see. So, the things that corrupt and defile a man or a woman is not unwashed hands, but an unwashed heart. Should we give attention to the matters of religion? Well, of course. We should do it with a view to cultivate religious practices that honor God and help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In Luke, Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. It really does matter what's in your heart. We should all be about the business of examining our hearts on a regular basis, making sure our hearts belong to Jesus. For then and only then can the real you stand up. Where does your heart lie? What's in your heart that you need to work on? What do you have to do for the real you to be seen? Thanks be to God.